Дамы и господа, президент Российской Федерации Владимир Владимирович Путин. Misleading health care information, dangerous hoaxes, outlandish conspiracy theories, and consumer fraud. All of these things are threats to public health in normal times. And with the COVID-19 pandemic spreading across the globe, we are, to say the least, not living in normal times. The European Union has uncovered a series of disinformation campaigns from hostile foreign actors such as Russia and China. Among the claims, drinking bleach or pure alcohol can cure the novel coronavirus. COVID-19 is an infection caused by elites to reduce population growth and that 5G installations are spreading the virus. This isn't just trolling, it's costing lives. And today, we'll talk to the European Union official who is fighting this campaign on the front lines. Hello from Washington, D.C., and welcome to the Power Vertical Podcast. My name is Brian Whitmore, director of the Russia program at SIPA. And joining us from Brussels is Lutz Gollner, head of the Strategic Communications Division at the European External Action Service. Welcome to the podcast, Lutz. Very good to be here. Good to have good to have you. And also joining us here in Washington is SIPA's president and CEO, Dr. Alina Polyakova. Welcome back, Alina. Thanks for having me back, Brian. Hey, thanks for coming back. Uh, now, Lutz, let's start with you. I, earlier this year, the European External Action Service said that Russia and China continue to deploy a campaign of disinformation around the coronavirus outbreak that could be, quote, could, could, quote, have harmful consequences for public health. In late May, just a couple of weeks ago, the EEAS reported seeing a, at least a temporary decrease in the amount of disinformation surrounding the coronavirus pandemic. EU monitors added, however, that external actors, notably pro-Kremlin sources, are still active in spreading false information on the outbreak. Luke, I was wondering if you can get us started by kind of painting, painting us a picture. What is Europe facing that right now? What are the main narratives? What are the main vectors? What are the public health consequences? And how is the EU fighting back against this? Thank you, Brian. I mean, uh, these are many questions. Um, and maybe let me start by saying I'm not the only one fighting this here. This is, of course, a, a much broader team that is involved, not only in my own team, but also with many other actors that are getting equipped in this. Um, but what have we seen in this COVID-19 crisis? And how did this play out. We saw basically this very famous infodemic that a lot of people talk about. So a lot of very different information, misinformation, disinformation, uh, coming in very different uh, shapes and, and forms. Uh, you mentioned some of them yourself already. We have seen conspiracy theories. Uh, we have seen misleading healthcare information. We have seen consumer fraud all sorts of things. And uh, at first glance, of course, it's not very clear where does this come from? Who are the actors? And we have done quite some work over the past uh, months and, and weeks in particular, since the beginning of the crisis, you know, to, to put a filter a bit on and to see how did beyond all the misinformation that we are seeing and also this domestic discussion and sometimes domestic confusion, how is this actually being used or misused by external actors. And what we discovered um, was that there are a number of external actors, but mainly uh, what we call the pro-Kremlin disinformation ecosystem uh, that is very clearly using these internal debates and also this confusion um, very often also opportunistically jumping on these debates and reinforcing, sometimes amplifying some of these narratives. Um, and you can find kind of many, many examples. I think you mentioned yourself already the 5G issue, for example, you know, to make this link between 5G and uh, the coronavirus or the, the COVID-19, how is this uh, interrelated? So we see many kind of stories and narratives that are coming out 
at the same time uh, on various channels, some of them state sponsored and, and clearly state channels, some of them where we know that they're very close. So we see this, this coordination. But you ask also- Excuse me, if I may interrupt you for a moment, Lutz, just, just to be clear, I mean, these are existing debates that are going on in Europe, the Kremlin pro-Kremlin sources are exploiting, or is this a case of the Kremlin sources instigating and creating these narratives? I think one of the new things that we are seeing in disinformation in general is that we see less and less kind of new productions, let's say new inventions of stories of narratives from outside, but more and more an opportunistic uh, behavior of jumping in existing, on existing uh, let's say, domestic debates. Um, we have seen this to a certain extent already in, uh, in the US in 2016, but uh, let's say we have experienced this now much more, this amplification of, of these things. But um, we can still distill kind of a sort of uh, meta narrative, you know, some of an overarching narrative uh, that we can also very clearly kind of associate uh, to these Russian or pro-Kremlin and also to a lot of Chinese actors. And that is the narrative that a democracy, uh, the modern kind of democratic societies or liberal democratic societies, and often also related to the very nature of the European Union, that they are incapable of dealing with this, uh, with this crisis, you know, just because of their democratic uh, um, constitution, let's call it like this. And the flip side is a narrative that there are other ways, other ways of organizing your society. And that is code, of course, for authoritarian uh, kind of forms, governmental forms and, and uh, institutional forms, that they are much more efficient. But um, uh, the 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 let's say the overall kind of narrative was always broke kind of uh, let's say broken down to to specific examples like the 5G, like conspiracy theories around the involvement of the Gates Foundation or Bill Gates personally, and we see a lot of of these uh, of these things. Has it dis decreased a little bit um, since there is this opportunistic nature of disinformation? Uh, disinformation actors and the amplification is moving on, you know, uh, and as much as we have seen a decrease in the discussion about COVID-19 and the coronavirus, you can measure this even with uh, whatever, just Google searches, for example, uh, we see a clear decrease, uh, which is an indicator also for a less intense kind of public debate. Uh, we see also a decrease, let's say, of the disinformation activities around it, uh, which doesn't mean that this is not a threat anymore or that we have dealt with this in, a, in, a, in an efficient way and we can uh, kind of uh, go to the next chapter or something, but it's just a correlation of of this activity. No, it's interesting. You're, I mean, this meta narrative that democracies are not good at handling this. If you look at the actual record, the countries that have been the best at handling of this happen to be democracies. Speaking, of course, of Germany, New Zealand, South Korea, right? and the countries that have struggled with it tend to be either populist or authoritarian countries: Belarus, Russia. Brazil, for example. So it's interesting that that goes directly against the, uh, the, 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 the facts. The other thing, I'm, I mean, you noticed, I was really, what really kind of caught my eye was your report that said there was this decrease, and I was wondering why that is. And I mean, you, you, you could kind of put it into how COVID has kind of been normalized, and we're all kind of getting used to living in this COVID world, and it's almost as if this is also happening in the disinformation space where COVID is just becoming part of the landscape so that th this would naturally decrease. I was wondering, did you, did, did you come across that or what, what, did you, what did you attribute this decrease to? Now, I use the term opportunistically very often because I think this is the new characteristics of disinformation, uh, that there are actors out there also uh, external actors, foreign actors, that are kind of very carefully and very clearly sensing kind of where these domestic debates are going and then putting their finger uh, on, the, on the pulse. Uh, what is the intention behind is, of course, kind of sowing confusion, sowing mistrust, um, or advancing your own interest in, a, in another way. Um, so the 
the good old style of, let's say, finding the actor, finding the source and being able to attribute it very clearly will become more and more difficult. And we have seen exactly that kind of with the, with the corona discussion or with the corona disinformation as well. The moment there is less, let's say, public debate about this, the less also these disinformation actors kind of push these narratives and move to the next issue. Um, and I think this is also what you're seeing at the moment in the United States, looking at, uh, at issues related uh, to uh, whatever uh, racial uh, issues, etc., or police violence, you know? So this is the, the very nature of it. It doesn't make it uh, easier to detect. It doesn't make it less dangerous, uh, but it is clearly one of these, of these elements that we see. Maybe another point to make here is that disinformation is less and less kind of very um, direct, you know, it never says kind of uh, in, in black uh, uh, fat print letters, you know, uh, liberal democracies are less able to deal with uh, COVID-19 compared to authoritarian regimes. It comes in much more subtle forms in, in kind of impressions that are kind of given in the context that is created. And that's why we uh, need to be also careful in, in deducting what we are seeing. But what I mentioned in terms of this mega or meta narrative, uh, however you want to call this, it comes really from a collection of, of many, many cases, of many, many sources where we try to piece together what it is. And we see also differences in the different state actors. You know, The ones are going more for societal discussion and maybe more for division and confusion, uh, while others, and I think this is um, related to a lot of the, let's say, Chinese or China related actors, we also need to be careful, you know, not everything is easily attributable, not easily um, identifiable at the same time, but they pushed much more this, uh, this narrative of, look, there is kind of, we are doing everything right here, you know, in a, in a way that is using a lot of the, the manipulative uh, tactics also that we know from other actors. Yeah, no, I do want to dive a little bit deeper in the differences um, in the degree of convergence between the Russians and the Chinese. So I want to bring Alina into the discussion because Alina's done a lot of work in this space. Is there anything you want to add to that, Alina? Well, I guess just to follow up, I think there's you know, sort of two big questions that I keep thinking about in what you just said, Lutz. And uh, one is this question of attribution, of course, that keeps coming up. And um, how can governments with a degree of confidence and trust, truly attribute uh, certain covert operations um, to, let's say, other governments like Russia and China in this case. I'd be curious to get you to talk a little bit kind of through the methodological process um, that your team uses to the extent that you can talk about it, because I think this always comes up, right? Um, certainly uh, when we have um, official government statements, there's a tendency to uh, kind of question um, those statements these days. You know, we have sort of declining trust in our government institutions across um, our societies in the United States and also in European countries. So how do you um, convince people that what you're doing is in fact uh, trustworthy, that can be attributed to these actors? So that, I'll just put that one question out there. Um, and then my other question, feel, feel free to combine these, that also comes up a lot in this space is whose responsibility is it really? Um, is it the government's uh, responsibility to identify, uh, expose, and call out disinformation attacks? Or should more of the burden be placed on platforms? And obviously the European Union has been leading the charge in digital agenda. There's a lot more happening in the space um, in the months ahead. Um, some EU member states, uh, Germany, France, Sweden, others uh, have also instituted national level laws. But I think at the end of the day, that balance between the private and public sector is really hard to strike. And I'm curious to hear more about how you think about that and to the extent to which you know, you're working together with some of these companies as well when you're making um, your attribution analysis. 
I mean, on the question of attribution, uh, this is maybe the biggest challenge that all of us are, are facing because it is not a letter or something that you can kind of trace back and you see who was the sender. Um, because of the covered nature of the complicated uh, mechanisms also that are used for dissemination, for amplification, and maybe another element makes it even more difficult, and that is an increasing interaction between foreign entities in, in the broad sense, not only state actors, but uh, let's say even private entities kind of on, on, on foreign territory that are sometimes used uh, and their relationship to what we call local proxies. So what we, uh, what we are doing is, uh, is still very careful because we cannot attribute something where we don't have, have proof in any case. So it is a mix, let's say, of looking at uh, three different vectors at the same time. The first one is, of course, the content. Uh, we need to look at what it is, but I'm very careful about just, um, let's say, classifying uh, disinformation just by content because that's also from a democracy point of view from a freedom of speech point of view is, is relatively problematic if we say this is right and this is wrong and this is disinformation and not um, but uh, still it's one of the parameters of course that we need to look at then uh, uh, some uh, elements are of course related to the actors that we know and actors that we know if we look at the program then disinformation ecosystem uh, consists of a, of, a, of a range of a specter of different, uh, let's say, circles, you know, coming from state-controlled media, like the well-known Russia Today or, or uh, Sputnik or uh, things like that, or kind of where we know that um, either ownerships or finance of a certain website, of a certain outlet is very, very close to, to the Kremlin. We have developed a certain method methodology uh, on this, but again, also this is not the only and unique possibility to, let's say, identify. And then comes a third element in there, and that is the actor behavior. That is what technique is being used. Um, and uh, uh, Alina, you asked also, how do we piece all this together? Well, we have partly in-house capabilities, just by the mere fact that uh, my team here is, uh, is consisting of real specialists, both for the information space as much also for the, for the political context, you know, for the, for the structures behind knowing how this is being uh, set up and how these interactions are working. But um, we rely, of course, also a lot on, on what partners are doing and, and kind of cross-checking this uh, because we cannot and do not want to attribute anything uh, to an actor where we are not sure or where we don't have all the indicators in any case. And the indicators, as I said, are, are at least threefold, if not, if not more, that we need to look at the same time. And then on the, on the question of what is the responsibility of the ones and the others, um, from our perspective, this issue of disinformation, of the, of the information manipulation at large, is a much more complex issue than just foreign interference. It is one of the elements in there that we are looking at, in particular here in our foreign policy kind of outlet. Uh, but it is also, of course, a societal issue which goes much deeper and much further. That's why we need this combination of having the industry, in particular those that are kind of used as, a, as literally speaking, as the platforms. Um, but we need also the, the researchers, the NGOs that are, that are active there. And of course, we need governmental action at the same time so we need to piece these three three elements always together and of course there is a certain responsibility also for the industry there and that is the point that we made uh, maybe some of the of the listeners know that we have developed a an approach which is uh, at this moment a uh, a voluntary uh, kind of approach um, it's a code of practice so a set of rules that all the major platforms have subscribed to in terms of uh, committing themselves, uh, let me phrase it a bit more generally, to do more against disinformation in general, you know, to provide more and better 
let's say, uh, sources of reliable information to give more information also what is happening on the platforms to report regularly what are they doing also to address this issue. And while we are all sure that uh, this is maybe not the end point of, uh, of everything that we need to do, uh, it has nevertheless provided a good first stepping stone in seeing what works and what doesn't work. And this is what we're discussing here at the moment in the European Union, in Brussels. Um, what do we need to do as a next step, you know, uh, and base it on experience? Maybe a word on the, on the platforms. They have been remarkably active during the COVID-19 uh, situation. We have seen in particular the big ones who have really actively promoted reliable authoritative information or at least kind of uh, information where you can start to compare. They have also given more information about what they are doing. Uh, so they made some effort. Uh, but I think we all agree that there's still more to be done. And this is what the policy debate is currently about here. No, it's, it's interesting, Lutz, as you were talking, I mean, the, the, the phrase that kept coming to my mind is one of the ways I like to conceptualize this is information laundering, you know, using kind of the money laundering model and where in, you know, in combating money laundering, there's a role for the state, of course course, but also there are responsibilities on the part of the banks. And in this case, the platforms are kind of analogous to the banks moving this information across and, and laundering where we'll start in one platform, get picked up by another and become reified in the process. I know Alina wanted to jump in here, so I want to give her that opportunity. Now. Well, we recently learned that uh, TikTok, which is, of course, a Chinese social media platform, um, which says it's independent, but is de facto um, owned by the Chinese government, more or less, um, was invited to join the EU code of practice that you've been talking about by uh, Joseph Borrell, uh, who's you know, de facto the, the foreign minister for the European Union, the high representative. Uh, I guess the question I would have is, you know, how do you think about that? Clearly, uh, TikTok, uh, now one of the largest social media platforms in the world, um, while at the same time, we have very little insight into their data collection, uh, their policies around data privacy and data protection, which, of course, uh, the European GDPR was designed to protect uh, the use of private data. Um, and the code of practice is supposed to introduce you know, more transparency and accountability into how platforms use users' data uh, more broadly, what they're doing in terms of countering disinformation. So, there's been a, it's been a very controversial issue, uh, the notion of potentially including TikTok in, in the voluntary code of practice. So I'm just curious to hear more about uh, how maybe you're thinking about it, how um, the EAS is thinking about it, given the recent uh, announcements attributing these massive disinformation attacks uh, to China specifically. Well, that's a, a very, very pertinent and important question is about who to include, who is responsible, where's the accountability, how far can you go also in this? And this is not only a foreign policy issue, and that's why it's not only the foreign policy chief here, Josep Borrell, but also many others like uh, here the vice president, uh, Ms. Jourova, who is, uh, who is re really leading on this and also... Um, uh, our commissioner dealing with the, the digital uh, world, uh, Mr. Breton, dealing with this. So I think uh, the main idea is to say the best instrument that we have at the moment available may be voluntary and may be criticized because it doesn't have uh, maybe real legal teeth yet. But nevertheless, it has worked. It has produced something and it has apparently put pressure on those who signed up to this uh, to report and to do things, you know, at least to, to uh, let's say, advance a little bit more transparency. And that's why I think kind of new players um, and relevant stakeholders, um, and I think I would clearly um, put TikTok into, into, this, into this field, um, if they were to join these obligations, that would be good news. And what, we, what do we have in mind, actually, is uh, to make reporting about their activities a much more stringent um, 
let's say, exercise for them. And what, what is it that we would like to know more about? Uh, we would first, of course, like to know also what the existing signatories, but also maybe the new ones like, like TikTok, what do they do to promote authoritative content? You know? Is there anything that they are doing? Uh, and if they are not doing anything, maybe already the question triggers something. The second one is initiatives and tools to, to improve the awareness of users. You know? Do we need to put labels? Do we need to put warning signs? Do we need to, uh, whatever, have, have occasional questions or something? Again, just by asking these questions, just by making them report on that, uh, it may, or in many cases, it has triggered uh, reactions. Uh, same for manipulative behavior. You know? What do they do? about these malign influence operations, how the, the, sometimes the algorithms are, are played. And last but not least, of course, also the data flows on, on advertising. Uh, because here is still one issue that a lot of people are upset, and rightly so, that they say with disinformation, you can still make a lot of money. Disinformation can come from foreign entities, can also come, of course, from, uh, from domestic, uh, domestic actors. So I think this is, this is a good program. It's the best that we have at the moment. Uh, but uh, let's say even if, we, if um, this may not be considered enough, um, I can tell kind of the, the listeners to this podcast, you know, there is, a, of course, a discussion ongoing. What else do we need? And that is kind of what we are doing here. We have two other initiatives kind of in the pipeline, and these are currently being shaped. And they will take the experience with the platforms clearly into account. That is the whole idea here, that we do, uh, let's say, fact and experience-based um, uh, policymaking as well. I'm glad you mentioned Vice President Yurova, Lutz, because uh, just to remind our listeners, she'll be appearing at a SEPA virtual event next Friday. So just kind of to, to throw that out there. A couple other things I wanted to get into before we move into our second segment. And just briefly, if you can give us an idea, and this is like one of the million dollar questions we've always been asking, to what extent is there Russian-Chinese convergence on these disinfo campaigns? Or to what extent are the Russians and the Chinese each playing their own game and sometimes their interests overlap? Do you have any daylight into that? Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit careful on this because it, it um, kind of reads very easily, you know, that there's full convergence and everybody's working together. I think the picture is a bit more complex, a bit more, uh, let's say, complicated all in all. But it is a fact that some of the narratives have been pushed, you know, both by Chinese sources, by Russian sources, uh, and even also by others. By others, um, we uh, can see this, for example, with the kind of narratives around this issue of uh, uh, that the coronavirus was produced in some some U.S. military lab, for example. We also see some, uh, let's say, cross. Um, uh, reinforcement in terms of retweets and and kind of uh, uh, articulation or kind of a bit of of a support uh, to each other in uh, in just kind of in the dissemination, um, but I or at least my team does not have kind of the the full basis that we see here a joint operation. I would never go that that far. Um, what, what I said in the beginning, I think we need to keep in mind, a lot of these activities are, sorry to use that term again, and I hope the listeners don't get tired of me of using it, but are very opportunistic, you know? They're just jumping, they look what is there, they jump into these debates, um, and very often just kind of grabbing one of these debates, uh, amplifying them, um, kind of pushing kind of sometimes new, sometimes old elements in there. And that makes it so dangerous because um, it, is, it always looks like an existing societal debate, which may or not be, uh, I mean, you may or may not like it or the one or the other side, but it looks like, a, like an organic and, and genuine debate. And just by the mere fact that there is outside interference, that there is amplification, that there are people kind of pushing this, uh, we see a distortion. We see a, a manipulation, you know, that, that we need to, to address here. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, just last last thought. Um, um, I think Brian, you just mentioned uh, the kind of these these uh, kind of comparisons that we could use. We could use kind of 
two two other kind of comparisons. There is one like um, let's treat it a bit like consumer protection. You know, you're a consumer of information, and you don't want to be misled. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of bad products out there. To a certain extent, you need to be protected from that. To a certain extent, it's your own choice if you want to consume them. But you want to be sure that you're not manipulated against your will. This is the one side. Or the other side. You can also look at information like a public good, you know, so to say this brings all actors in society together uh, to safeguard this, this public good. And it's not about kind of telling people what is right or wrong. It's not the ministry of truth is more kind of a protection against manipulation. So one area where I did see what looked like convergence was where this narrative that the that COVID-19 was created in a U.S. military lab, and then that was kind of morphed onto this idea that the U.S. shouldn't be pushing for an investigation into China's early handling of the virus. This is pushing pushed by Russian sources until the Americans also are investigated because, and so you've seen, I saw like what looked like convergence there, but I, but I wasn't quite sure. The last thing I wanted to hit on, again, you both to weigh in on this because this is something that's kind of fascinating to me is that this is not really our first rodeo in terms of Russian uh, public health disinformation or Soviet public health disinformation. We all remember the campaign surrounding HIV AIDS in the 1980s, or at least I do. I was, I, I, was, I was old enough to remember that. And this was, I mean, this was, of course, a different era. It wasn't the era of the internet. It wasn't the era of social media. But the way that that campaign took hold, I mean, it started with an article in a pro-Soviet Indian newspaper called Patriot, and it was picked up by other outlets. Then a, what, what I believe was a Stasi agent posing as a French doctor began to push this information out. And it's been, it was picked up in dozens of countries. Um, and this was the pre-internet age. I was wondering if either of you saw lessons from the HIV AIDS campaign, um, which in a lot of ways was a prologue to what we're looking at today. I'm, I'm very careful in kind of using all these parallels. I mean, of course, there are similarities and techniques and not everything is new in the in the internet uh, or, or in the, uh, let's say, in the social media world. Um, but let's say the basic techniques of that somewhere, either you produce a kind of uh, something that you want to be disseminated and you need to be very kind of tactically clear on how you want to do this. Um, and I think there are plenty of great works uh, out there, you know, also for historical references, Thomas Reed book on, on active measures, for example, I would always uh, recommend exactly for those, uh, for those campaigns. But I come back to the, to the point that I made a couple of times already is uh, this is a lot of this stuff is already in our societies. There is a lot of debate about certain things. And some of these debates are even, let's call them genuine. You know, I mean, I don't want to use the word legitimate because then it says what is legitimate and what is illegitimate. But um, again, so people are using these, these moments and, and pushing kind of, uh, the one side or the other side, or in even we have seen this uh, during our migration kind of situation where there was a big public debate in, in all over the, the European Union, um, where we have seen disinformation activities on both sides, on the pro and the anti-migration uh, kind of end uh, from the same actors, you know? And what was the aim? Was really to saw this discussion, to saw this confusion and to build up kind of this this, let's say, this corrosive element in the, in the debates. Aline, any last thoughts before we move into the second segment? Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned, at least about how uh, for decades, uh, almost uh, a century now, uh, the Russians and the Soviet Union before that um, have been using active measures um, and disinformation as a tool of political warfare against the West. And certainly, uh, I was immediately reminded of uh, Operation Infection uh, when I, I saw some of the Russian narratives around COVID-19, these conspiracy theories that the virus was invented in a US lab, that it was released on purpose by the United States, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so not, not much has changed in the strategy, I would say. But of course, what the big difference is now is just how quickly these um, theories can spread in digital domain. Operation Infection, 
I did some research on this a little while ago. It took about six years to go from the initial plant at a fringe Soviet controlled Indian paper um, all the way to being on the six o'clock news in the United States. Now that happens, you know, in minutes on, on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. And so the ecosystem in the, of the information environment has become, you know, much more diverse. There are mo many more opportunities for threat vectors to enter um, in various social media platforms um, through shell websites and things of that nature. So before you had to set up a whole news agency to plant a story, now you just set up a quick website and you don't have to do that. You know, you can just tweet something out um, and then promote it and amplify it. So I think that's the reality we're dealing with uh, in the 21st century. And I think um, a lot of the lags that we see in our ability to respond to this new reality has to do with the fact that our democratic institutions were not really built for this at the end of the day. You know, the democratic de deliberation process when it comes to policy making is inherently long and it is long by design because it's supposed to include many different viewpoints from many different stakeholders, private sector, civil society, research groups, you know, allied governments, um, et cetera. Um, private sector interests, individuals, I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, and the, but the threat is moving at such a rapid rate. And so we're constantly, constantly falling behind uh, our ability to get ahead of this. So I think the work that um, the EAS and our European uh, allies, friends and colleagues have been doing is trying to get us to close that gap and trying to get us a bit ahead of the threat. Uh, but we still have a really long ways to go exactly because we have this disconnect between the policymaking process um, and the rapid development of digital threats. That's a perfect segue, Alina, because I want to get ahead of the curve a little bit here. In a few moments, we'll continue our discussion and take a look at a looming and very disturbing disinformation campaign that could be lurking just around the corner on both sides of the Atlantic. I'd like to remind you, you are listening to the Power Vertical Podcast. My name is Brian Whitmore, director of the Russia program at SIPA. Joining us from Brussels is Lutz Gallner, head of the Strategic Communications Division at the European External Action Service. Also joining us here in Washington is SEPA President and CEO, Dr. Alina Polyakova. I'd also like to remind you, you could subscribe to the Power Vertical Podcast on iTunes. You could read the Power Vertical blog and watch the vertical video at SEPA.org. And you could follow us on the Twitter at Power Vertical. So here's something to keep us all up at night as if we needed anything else to keep us all up at night. What if all the disinformation we have witnessed around COVID-19 so far, the conspiracies about 5G and Bill Gates, the false claims about bleach and pure alcohol, were just a warm up for the main act? What if we get a COVID-19 vaccine, but anti-vaxxer campaigners have been so successful at sowing doubt that a significant portion of the population simply refuses to take it. This is not as far-fetched as it may seem. Here's how the New York Times columnist Kevin Roos presented the problem in a recent article, and I quote, I've been following the anti-vaccine community on and off for years, watching its members operate in private face group, uh, Facebook groups and Instagram accounts, and have found them to be much more organized and strategic than many of their critics believe. They are savvy media manipulators, effective communicators, and experienced at exploiting the weaknesses of social media platforms. In short, the anti-vaxxers have been practicing for this, and I am worried that they will be unusually effective in sowing doubts about a COVID-9 vaccine. Lutz, I, I read the, several of the EEAS reports on this, and the, you do see a lot of references to the anti-vaxxers in COVID-19 uh, disinformation campaigns. They were very prominent in recent anti-lockdown protests in New York, if I can believe the news reports that I read, I mean, and, and in Germany. Uh, 
they, well, let me let me go back. <clears throat> they were very prominent in recent anti-lockdown protests in Germany, if I could believe the news reports I read. And Russ, Russia's role in amplifying the anti-vaxxers has been very, very well documented. When you look at this problem going forward, how big of a problem do you see here? And what can we do on both sides of the Atlantic to get ahead of it? Because this could be very, this could be deadly in terms of public health. Well, first of all, it is a societal issue. Um, left aside from foreign interference about the role of, of vaccines, uh, what is your role, your responsibility as a member of society as well to uh, kind of for the public good in the end. Um, we have seen uh, these these links uh, of anti-vaxxers of uh, but in different shapes and forms in particular you know some people who are kind of uh, very clearly opposed to any any vaccinations and then down to people who link it and this is uh, what we have seen a lot by the way interesting um, uh, or interestingly is the fact that vaccines and kind of a vaccination or an alleged uh, vaccination obligation is linked to some shadowy international conspiracy, basically. This is really kind of what we have seen a lot. Um, the, this came also in different forms and shapes from a lot of the pro-Kremlin ecosystem actors, let's call it disinformation, sorry, ecosystem actors. Uh, we have seen it in the form of uh, that this is kind of a, a Bill Gates or Gates Foundation uh, idea to dominate the world, uh, to sell uh, you know these things, but we have seen quite a lot of this also to implant microchips and uh, and also this here what is what is the 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 role that a lot of these disinformation outlets are playing? They play a very very sometimes a very subtle role otherwise it would be it would be easy you know if we if we can attribute it if we can identify it easily in some cases we can, but the problem is if they jump on existing voices, if they jump on uh, people who might even have a status, you know, we have a case, for example, here in, in the EU that it was a, uh, in, uh, in Italy, a member of the European Parliament who kind of advanced exactly those, uh, those theories uh, that this is all kind of a, uh, a conspiracy. Um, I can't remember all the details now. And just by let's say, very detailed reporting about this, uh, just by not even putting it into context, just by kind of giving this so much prominence and linking it also to uh, kind of uh, so-called other sources, you know, that go exactly in the, right, in, the, in the same direction, that shows that this narrative is clearly pushed. You know, um, and this, um, but we always need to be careful. You know, there is not kind of the statement coming uh, very clearly, and you can see in kind of in line one, you know, how the lie is constructed and how it ends. It comes in 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 a bit more subtle forms, but that makes it so dangerous, uh, in my view, and that's why it's even if it's proper reporting as to, at first glance. The, the subtleness um, and the coordinated kind of messaging at the same time is the real is the real problem. And what is the societal issue? Is that it exactly reinforces these doubts? That it reinforces the questions. People get, of course, a little bit confused, you know, with what is the right thing to do. Sometimes they also hear from from uh, authorities. They hear different perspectives or different advice or an advice might change over time and if then somebody is using this and we have seen it exactly in those cases this has one political aim or one sometimes even commercial aim because you can make a lot of money with this as well but in the case of foreign actors it's very political and that is to undermine kind of the trust the, to undermine kind of the the, the trust in the in the stability of uh, the public institutions but let me just put it let me just put it in in context again because i get a lot of criticisms when i say this in in public events you know they say ah you make it very easy you just attribute it to russia and you say public authorities in the eu are always right that is of course not what i'm saying what i'm saying is that there's a very subtle strategy here behind that is corrosively medium to long term 
undermining kind of this this feeling and reinforcing maybe something that exists already in society i don't want to say that all this comes from outside there's nothing from inside of course there's a lot uh, also of of uh, of a domestic debate but it is it is pushing this it is uh, kind of using it so lutz this is a perfect example to to use your favorite word, and I don't think the listeners are tired of that word because I think it's appropriate, is this opportunistic, um, opportunistic use of things that are organic in our societies on both sides of the Atlantic, but that hostile foreign actors like Russia are opportunistically using this. And the anti-vaxxer thing, I think, presents a, just a, a potentially really deadly one because right now, for obvious reasons, there's, good, there's a mad dash to push a vaccine as fast as possible, and that's going to create doubts about it as in, in, in play into the anti-vaxxers fears hostile foreign actors are poised to, to manipulate this it's, a, it's to me it's a very frightening situation i don't know alina if you're as <clears throat> bothered by it as i am but if do you have any any thoughts on this well i think certainly even though we tend to focus a lot on foreign influence operations uh, emanating from authoritarian states i think the reality is that a lot of disinformation actually happens domestically. And that presents the biggest challenge to democracies in some ways, because that's also an opportunity to amplify for countries like Russia, China, and China. And we have fewer tools um, to really uh, direct resources um, against you know, US citizens, European citizens, who are sharing misleading information for whatever reason. Um, the anti-vax movement is perhaps the most dangerous one uh, because it does have very, very real uh, public health effects and produces very, very real um, consequences in terms of illness and sometimes death. And what's interesting about that specific sort of disinformation ecosystem um, is that it doesn't really conform to any political spectrum. You have individuals who likely identify very much on the left and very much on the right. Um, who are uh, participating in these kinds of um, misleading stories, misleading information, sharing them, propagating it. So to my mind, I think that's the, the key question that uh, we haven't been able to answer is what do we do when uh, we have to protect freedom of speech and in the United States First Amendment rights of our citizens, uh, but uh, the information that citizens are sharing um, is having uh, negative societal effects. So uh, to my mind, that's a huge question mark still um, that those of us who are working in foreign policy space, you know, just like to put in, away in a box and say, well, let's try to at least deal with the foreign element of all this. Um, but I think in, in reality, these are all the same information ecosystems and the foreign piece interacts with the domestic piece and that's what makes it so complex. Um, so I think the verifications of uh, the COVID-19 crisis and how that's provided sort of perfect fodder and perfect uh, kindling for the anti-vax movement, um, I think is, is profoundly worrisome. Um, and be, we have fewer tools to really deal with it than we do with the foreign threat. Yeah. No, I, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes famously said, shouting fire in a crowded theater is not protected speech under the First Amendment. If I, if I know my U.S. Supreme Court history correctly, if I got it wrong, somebody will, somebody will correct me on Twitter, I'm sure. I'm getting the word from our control room that we're pushing up against the end. Lutz, I want literally, we've got about a minute to go. Any last uh, thoughts before we wrap it up? Good. I think I cannot do a podcast as a European official and not uh, promoting a little bit our own approach here. Um, as European Union, because I think we're really thought leaders on, on this one. We have, we are not perfect, uh, but we have made a great deal of thinking and a great deal of progress as well there. And I think there are five elements that we spelled out and that we learned from the COVID crisis and that we will invest further. The first one is really to understand better what is going on. We still, I mean, I know that Alina and, and her colleagues and many on the, on the side of, uh, let me call you, civil society at large, researchers, 
kind of real specialized kind of uh, think tanks, etc., have a lot of knowledge, but we still need to invest more, you know, in knowing what's going on. The second one, we also need to go out there, you know, we cannot leave the communication space just to others, you know. If there is no way of kind of having a reference point, um, uh, maybe to look at what, what do other people say, then kind of others will, will capture this, this place. And then, of course, pulling all the loose ends together. There are so many people that are working on this, that have great ideas nationally or kind of regionally or even internationally. And that's why we believe, and especially what we are doing in the G7 context, you know, that is, uh, we do good work there. We learn from each other. We all face different, different forms of it. And last but not least is, of course, the work with the platforms uh, that I described and that Vice President Jurova might go into more detail, I guess, uh, when you have your events. And, of course, one of the aims is to strengthen and to, to empower civil society to deal with this. Because only with the resilience of civil society, you can approach this issue, which is partly external, partly a security issue, but partly a very classic societal issue that needs to be addressed. And because it is mixed and because it's intermingling, uh, that makes it so, so difficult. Well, that is a great note to wrap it up on. I always love wrapping things up on resilience because I think that's, a, that's, that's at the heart of a lot of this. On that note, we'll wrap it up. That's all we have time for today. I would like to remind you, you have been listening to Power Article Podcast. My name is Brian Whitmore, Director of the Russian Program here at SIPA. Joining us from Brussels has been Lutz Gellner, Head of the Strategic Communications Division at the European External Action Service. Also joining us here in Washington has been SIPA's President and CEO, Dr. Alina Polyakova. Thank you both for an enlightening and lively discussion. I'd also like to thank our producer, Michal Harmata, in the virtual control room for keeping the lights on and all the complicated machines well-oiled and in working order throughout our discussion. I'd also like to remind you, you can subscribe to the Power Vertical podcast on iTunes. You can read the Power Vertical blog and watch the vertical video at SEPA.org. And you can follow us on the Twitter at Power Vertical. I'd also like to encourage our listeners to tune in to the EU Now podcast produced by our good friends at the EU Mission here in Washington, D.C. And a Quick programming note, as I noted earlier, on June 26th, SIPA will be hosting a virtual conversation with Vera Jurova, Vice President of the European Commission for Values and Transparency. Join us again next week. And now, as always, I leave you with the ambient sound mix our producers have created for your enjoyment. <laughs>